Hi, my name's Rachel, and today we're talking about, again, The Night and Its Moon by Piper CJ. If you have not watched the first video that I did on this book, it is linked in the first thing in the description down below. I suggest you go watch it for context. Oh, come on. God, fuck my computer, man. Fucking, fucking shit. I'm not gonna go through the entire book beat by beat again like I did in that. I'm not gonna touch on what happened to make this eligible for did it deserve one star in the first place. Uh, instead, I'm going to hone in on the technical issues here, of which I have several critiques of several different things. Basically everything from like prose to plot to character arcs. As well as discuss the plagiarism again because it, because it is still very much present. And I will bring up the parts that I think changed from the last version, which there isn't much, as well as go into more depth about what happens to Knox in this book, particularly with the whipping scene, because I think that that should have been taken out. Um, first some things I gotta say. Thank you for being a friend to my patrons. First to Lex, SJ, and Eric for paying my therapy bill. Welcome Eric, the newcomer, and my potato starch Marxists, Allison, Carlin, Ebby, Kate, Katie O, Marcella, Molly, Paige, Reba, Shannon, Sarah, Sean, Chris, Jules, and CJ. My Patreon is linked below. It comes with early access and stuff if you're interested in that. It's also like voting and behind the scenes stuff. Also, I have open commissions, so if you want to commission me for a review, I currently have a little bit of a list, but I think I can get through it fairly quickly. Um, Holly, if you're watching this, I am... Um, about 50% through your work and I will be getting your feedback to you soon. Anyways, if you want to commission me to review your work or somebody else's, uh, the coffee is linked down below. Okay, here we are again. Boy, have some things happened between the time of now and the time that I first reviewed the, well, the earlier version of this book. So let's go over everything. You may be asking, Rachel, why this book? Again, simply, uh, capitalism, because my audience asked me to. This is what I get paid to do. People tell me to read stuff and I read stuff. I am a content creator and a book reviewer. People pay me to review certain books. People sometimes pay me to review books that they just hated. Like I just got commissioned to read Ready Player One because somebody really hated it. I expect I won't like it. I think the I think the person who commissioned it probably expects I won't like it either. So again, in short, the answer is capitalism. This is my job. I review books for money. Every feedback that I give is given in good faith. These are my actual views and opinions. I do not sugarcoat and I am not particularly um, easy on books. I guess you could say. <laughs> <laughs> but I already read this, right? So why review it again? Because when I first reviewed this book, it was uh, self-published. I reviewed it, then the author of this got picked up by Bloom, which I think is like a subsect. What's that word when you're a subsect of another publisher? I think that Bloom is part of source books. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure it's source books. Anyway, uh, it got picked up by Bloom. So it's it got traditionally republished. The author and the publisher decided to create a revised version. They put that on NetGalley. It was available as Read Now one day when I was on there and I was like, oh, new version, new video. It was released, re-released on September 20 something. I don't know what is time. So this is technically a new revised version that I'm reviewing, but I gotta tell you it's still a one star book for me and it desperately needed some editing. My god. All right, um, before I continue, I need to speak to a particular group of people who are inevitably watching this. There are people who are watching this in bad faith. Stan's um, Piper's friend particularly one who keeps coming into my comments. Y'all don't like me and that's fine. I don't care if you don't like me. All I asked from you before speaking to me in my comments section, whoever you are who is here to defend her, wait until the end when you have heard everything I'm going to say, hear my entire video before commenting. That is my one rule. Please abide. Thank you. All right, moving along to the review. The only changes that I noticed in the beginning of this book were some added scenes. Later, I noticed that one scene that I remembered was removed. I likely missed some changes though. It has been some time since I read the original version. I've read several books in between then obviously, so I can't give you beat for beat differences, but to my knowledge the majority of this has stayed the same. There are some added differences particularly to the beginning of the story uh, by way of Knox and Amaris at the orphanage they grew up in, but it wasn't enough that I actually felt that it did anything for the story itself or for what I assume it was there for to build the relationship between the characters. So it was not enough for me to root for the relationship. It didn't do anything for me as the reader understanding the world that the author was trying to create. Um, so having finished it now twice, I would say I'm not really sure why the editor and the author chose to add those scenes, but didn't 
choose to add scenes of them say actually like in classes at the orphanage really learning about the world so that the reader could understand the lore and learn along with our main characters. For instance at around 60% the term witch starts getting thrown around and you're like whoa 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 <laughs> where did witches fit into this world exactly? I still don't know because the author never chose to take the time to explain that or to write any lore on that. We could have learned it again at the same time as Nox and Amaris learned it but we didn't and that's a shame. Millicent the brothel owner who comes to buy Amaris but then ends up buying Nox as a quote consolation prize is apparently a witch which is weird because Amaris thinks looking upon her at the first time she sees her that she looks like a witch but what does a witch look like? Like what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> that's the first time we hear the word witch used with zero context and then at around 60% it starts to get used more and more and more and it turns out that Millicent is actually a witch but in her case she has like this weird lizard hand and when she touches people they either fall into a coma or die. Okay so is that what makes her a witch? Nobody knows that so how is it that Amaris looked upon her and said she looks like a witch but then why does Amaris also get accused of being a witch when her friends find out that she has powers of persuasion when she speaks? She doesn't have a physical trait similar to Millicent so what does it mean to be a witch in this world? Where does that come into play with the fae? Where does being a witch come into play with the religion? All of these are unanswered questions and they could have lent themselves to a good story had they been answered. Uh, let's actually talk about the religion because that's another issue that I had with the initial version and again with this version it did not change or get better whatsoever it's the exact same. The author claims that the whipping scene right which I will talk again about in a little bit in a different context was inspired by her own experiences um, at the hands of growing up in the church. So that would make you think that this whole book was maybe inspired by religious trauma and if you're going to use your religious experiences in one scene you would think that the author would continue that throughout the book making commentary on the church making commentary on uh, deconstructing from religion but it's not apparently that one experience of, of hers was randomly thrown in and there's no cohesive use of the church or the religion throughout the book in fundamentalist evangelical Christianity the origins of Christianity are used to justify the oppression and subjugation of women God is seen as a man God made Adam first, God made Eve using a piece of Adam, and this is used to create this sort of umbrella of dominance where, and that's like literal, they use this umbrella method, where God is the head umbrella and he covers the man, but then everyone else is under the man of the house, and this is how fundy families are constructed where the women, is in, the women are in charge of children until the boys are a certain age, but the man is over everybody and then God covers everybody. So the only person who a man can defer to is God. So you know who's in charge of whom and why in the religion. And there is plenty of books, the Gracier comes to mind, where this patriarchal structure of religion is talked about and discussed. And I think that there was an opportunity here to do that and it wasn't taken. In this world, there is no even discussion of misogyny or masculinity or patriarchy that is like cohesive despite despite everyone seemingly having belief in this one religion where the religious deity is a woman and the head like the main priestess is a woman and the only person who can go into that temple is other women no men allowed it's not making any religious commentary it, it doesn't help you understand the world that the author is creating or the world that this is inspired by it's just there to use as a plot device when needed and then it's forgotten when it's not needed which is a shame because religion being explored and fantasy is one of my favorite things. Again, I really like it in The Grace Year, uh, which is technically dystopian. I really liked it in um, Fury Born, which is like my favorite book. I like to see these questions answered. How does the religion affect the politics? How does it affect legislation from country to country? How much power does the church have and what do they use that power for? Does the church uplift those who are in lower classes? Do they take over for the poor and the marginalized when the upper classes fail them? And how does this come to play in the story? That doesn't exist whatsoever in this book. And it should have because that would have been an easy way to make this a very rich story. If she's got commentary on religious trauma and people and how that plays into politics, I want to hear it because that's my shit. It's present in, again, so many books that I love. In Furyborn, it's so inextricably woven into the world and the magic and the politics and the plot, whereas here it's just a thing that came up once in a while.
while. The only other time I can think of religion coming into play, and this was something I actually liked, so I wish the author had like done this more, is this one scene where Amaris is talking to her stand-in father, not Geralt, and, and he asks, what do you know of history or geography? And she's like, I didn't learn shit about that in the church-run orphanage. But she says, I know how to read and write, I've memorized prayers, I know court decorum, and I know all about the royal family, I'm not stupid. And he says to her, there's a difference between stupidity and ignorance. And I assume that that was a dig at Fundy schools, which if so, bravo, because I'm same page. Because Fundy schools, and I've talked about this on my channel because I went to Fundy schools growing up, use curriculums like Abeka and ACE and BJU that keep you stupid, um, keep you in ignorance. They teach you altered versions of history, American exceptionalism, they teach outright racism and misogyny, and they teach you to be ignorant instead of valuing critical thinking. Sure, you're not like technically stupid, but you're ignorant when you leave these Fundy schools because they want you to have a very particular narrow view of the world so that they can control your thinking patterns and therefore your life. And that's what I think the author was doing there in that conversation, which I very much appreciate. But why wasn't it utilized anywhere else in the book? It was just such a waste. <laughs> Uh, she references Amaris learning things like prayers and the virtues, which comes with a capital V, so that must be important, but we have no context of what that is and what that entails. And then again, when Amaris goes to the tem temple of the All-Mother, she is told that the men she brought with her cannot enter, and then some weird verbal gymnastics is done trying to explain why men like the bishop were put in charge of the church and therefore were in charge of beating Knox when she messed up at the church and why the bishop was more in, in charge than the lady at the orphanage, but then men can't even enter the temple. The hierarchy based on gender in this book does not make sense because it's not based in a religion that makes sense. It just seems like we were flying by the seat of our pants writing this. Real quick, the way that gender is talked about in this book, I don't like it. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm still so annoyed by this because what an opportunity wasted yet again. Amaris at one point refers to men as the lesser sex and then men are not allowed in the temple of the all mother but then she faces raging mis misogyny in in the you know Karamora knockoff witcher mountain and Knox faces constant misogyny because women are seen as a commodity in sex work in a way that men are not in this book i just i don't understand i don't get it uh the issue i had with the prose it stayed the same the issues with her using words like betwixt in some chapter <laughs> i'm sorry but then later using anachronisms like clout chaser just makes this book so awkward to read because depending on what chapter we're in the author is either trying to sound like Tolkien or trying to sound like she wrote My Immortal. There's no sense of creating her own unique voice to tell a story with fluidity. It just sort of feels like okay now we're in a Tolkien chapter and now it's My Immortal and now it's Cassandra Clare and now, and, and now it's Sarah J Mass. It's like you, you gotta you gotta find your own voice which I fully acknowledge is difficult but it is part of the process and why writing several drafts of your book is so necessary so that, that way you can really hone in on what your specific voice is. And there's no way that you write several drafts of a book in six days. Whoever edited this could have really helped the author and it's a shame that they didn't. My assumption <laughs> is that everyone at Bloom took one look at this whole situation and said, oh look, a cash grab, and didn't really think about making an actual quality product. Which sucks because I think that if this had been reworked from the ground off, uh, from the ground up rather, and the author had had the time and the people dedicated to making a quality product, they could have solved all of the issues that readers had with it. At least a hundred pages of this probably could have been 86. If an editor had just said, hey, stop trying to fit the entire fucking thesaurus in this book. Just say things one time. You only need to say it once to make an impact. You don't need to describe the same feeling or the same action across three or four sentences. One is enough, especially if you are not Ava Reed or Lainey Taylor and you don't know how to command language in a way that is inspiring. Instead, it's just a slog. And there are authors who do know how to command language, again, Lainey Taylor, Ava Reed, so that you hang on their every 
word and delight in their every description because it almost adds like a new color to an experience that you hadn't noticed before or shines light on an idea or a feeling that you hadn't had before. This is not one of those books. This is one of those books that's trying to be one of those books and unfortunately it shows. It also doesn't make sense to me that this has been edited not once but twice like even in like terms of copy editing because there were still so many spelling mistakes. I will say that one thing that did get better in the prose is the constant use of Amaris being referred to like the star as the starlet girl and Knox being you know the night girl. That did get toned down quite a bit and I appreciate that. I will give credit where credit is due because it was happening over and over in the original version. But then we still have these lines that made me go what the fuck? For instance she would bring the sea to her as all the salt in her body poured out from its bottomless well in her eyes. All the salt in her body is going to pour out of her eyes. I know you're trying to be figurative but in order for things to be figurative and not make me roll my eyes they have to at least make a little bit of sense and sound pretty. This is just stupid. Their faces drifted from an amalgamation of confusion to something accepting and contemplative as the men murmured amongst themselves. Uh, amalgamation means the process of uniting things. <laughs> That's not the right use of amalgamation. I don't think that's the term she meant to use there. And that's a common theme throughout the book is using words that don't quite fit. Another one that made me fucking shake my head was Amaris had needed to seal the suction cupped tentacles of her vicious emotions, clamping them into a locked safe inside of her in order to function. Uh, another one that I, I don't know what she's trying to convey here is the impulsivity fell from him like raindrops off a roof. What? Rage filled her with the ruby red heat of her failure what? <laughs> Trapped as she was inside the comatose illness of her own body, her eyes could only flutter open to blink yes or no to the simplest questions. That's not how comas work. Anyway, those are just some examples. I didn't feel like picking out the examples where she tries to convey the same feeling over three or four sentences because then I'd be sitting here for an hour doing just that, but just know it's in there. It drives me bonkers. I don't like it. All right, um, then there's that old standard Easter egg <laughs> in books, which didn't I just complain about? this being in a Sarah J Mass book. I think I did. Uh, the one where it's like, fold a piece of paper and where the two points meet with one destination and the opposite. It's trying to explain to you how teleporting works. I remember it. it I'm in Star Trek and in, uh, what's another book? Aurora Rising by Jay Kristoff has that in it. Um, basically like two minutes. I have been begging authors to find a different way to convey that idea. So there's a little Easter egg. Actually, speaking of Easter eggs, there's a lot of Easter eggs in this book. Um, but there's still also flat out plagiarism, which is why I can't in good conscience ever give this book above a one star. From like a craft perspective, it's probably a two, but if you blatantly plagiarized, I have to give you a one. Easter eggs are fine. Plagiarism, on the other hand, is not. Easter eggs in the book are, there are some examples, which these had to be pointed out to me because again, I grew up in Fundyland, so a lot of things are lost on me. The term person suit is apparently from Hannibal. I had no idea. Um, using the name Ayla because it's easier to pronounce is apparently from Can Clan of the Cave Bear. And because these are just one-liners, similar to the whole fold a piece of paper, yada yada, that's not plagiarism. Jay Kristoff does that all the time, and he also does plagiarism. So like, <laughs> there are clear differences. I understand and respect Easter eggs. These are one-liners. They are not entire character descriptions and backstories and arcs all formulated together to make an almost indistinguishable situation from another story. It becomes plagiarism when it's detail after detail after detail copied and pasted from one work to another. So much so that when I write it out in a paragraph and send it to my brother and say, what story is this? He says without hesitation, that's the Witcher. And the thing is about the plagiarism, it's not just <laughs> stealing from the books. It's also stealing from the video game and stealing from the TV show. So while the author used the term fast traveling, for instance, that feels like an Easter egg for video game players. I definitely picked up on that. And if it were just, oh, she used fast traveling, which yeah, that's in The Witcher. It's also in a bunch of other video games. I would have said, would have said yeah, that's, of course it's not plagiarism of The Witcher. It's not like her saying person suit, which is a shout out, or Ayla, which is a shout out. It's not, it's not a shout out when it's plagiarism, when it's detail after detail after detail that's indistinguishable from this other piece of media. And like speaking of this being a ripoff of not just the books, but the show, let's talk about Knox because people pointed out a few things to me. Um, firstly, it seems like this is sort of Yennefer and 
Siri fan fiction. Like what if Yennefer was Siri's love interest instead of Geralt's kind of thing. And the backstory has like minor parallels with like the whole beauty of Yennefer, yada yada, beauty of Nox. Okay. But it did not really occur to me how true that might be, that this might be Yennefer Siri fan fiction, until this TikTok was sent to me of the author addressing the racism in the book and says, yes, Nox is a woman of color and here, but here's a picture. And I'm like, um, <laughs> who the fuck is that? <laughs> Who is this white chick that, what? It looks like some artist went into one of those celebrity baby maker where you put two celebrities together and see what their child would look like. And it looks like they just added Kate Beckinsale and Amber Heard and came up with this white woman. Show me the adult child of Kate and Amber. Ta-da, like that's what that looks like. And she said, okay, here's Knox. And I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> hold on. I remember very distinctly, I distinctly remember doing all my research for the original video and probably still have it on my computer, the screen grabs of Knox were this South Asian model, British South Asian model, Neelam Gill. And, and thank you to Beth for pointing this out to me, if you look at the author's Pinterest board on, uh, on Knox and Amaris, it's got Neelam Gill and another South Asian model fan casted as Knox. So why is it suddenly that when the racism is pointed out, Neelam isn't being used anymore and instead it's Kate slash Amber Jr.? Anyways, the point is, you know who's also British but of South Asian descent? The actress who plays Yennefer in The Witcher on Netflix. And again, thank you to Beth for pointing this out. The Pinterest board created by this author, the one on Amaris. Guess who's there? Siri, who's surprised? Not me. And to again give you the reason why I think that this is plagiarism and not just Easter eggs or Slavic lore, let me list it for you once again. A half fate orphan girl with all white hair, a scar across her left eye, and an unexplained power she has no control over that comes out when she speaks, gets taken in by a surrogate father, and on his horse they ride to the mountain where that he and his people, assassins trained to kill demons, come from. The assassin Assassins are trained together but dispatched to do their work alone. There's only about a dozen of them now, but there used to be much more. She wants to be trained to become one of them. At this mountain, she incurred encounters misogyny and pushback from most of the men. She asks if there's a council she can appeal to to become one of them and is told there's no hierarchy among them, but one of the men who's been there the longest sort of has final say. Along the way, she finds out she has a very rare power that seems to come alive when she gets upset and yells. She grows up there at Assassin Mountain, is trained in fighting and potions and learns all about the creatures and beasties of the land. She's even taught about Jin, who can grant you three wishes. And one thing that I picked up from this read that I did not pick up from the last time, besides the use of fast travel, but again, that's in a lot of video games, is another thing from the video games, but specifically The Wild Hunt, which is The Witcher 3, which is so fun. So when you're playing and you like get Roach to speed up Roach the horse, Geralt says, come on Roach. And if you don't know, whenever Geralt gets a new horse, he always names it Roach. Well, in this book, Amaris, aka not Siri, and Odrin, aka not Geralt, are talking about his horse, and she's like, I want to name your horse. He, o Odrin says, I, I used to have a pet, and I always named my pet the same name. And then every new pet he got, the new pet would be named the same name as the original. And at the end of this conversation, they name the horse, and he says, come on, Cobb. And it's like, why didn't you just say Roach at this point? Just say Roach! <laughs> like... And if it had been just that, that would have felt like an Easter egg to me. But that combi combined with their relationship, her hair, the scar over her eye, her power, it's all of this together that makes it plagiarism. Separately, if you try to separate them, sure, they look like tropes, It's but it's not separately. I mean, if you did that to The Witcher too, like yeah, it, it would look like just, you know, separate things, but all together it creates this very particular story of The Witcher. <laughs> Which is why when I send this to my brother, he's like, I, I, I immediately identify that as the Witcher. I just, I feel like that's as simple as I can make it. I actually sent this to Lou and I was like, who is a bigger Witcher fan than I am? And I was like, am I, am I losing it? Or is this Witcher shit? And she's like, yeah, that's Witcher shit. Piper, is tea name similar to Witcher? No. Uh, but is Piper CJ's book similar to the Witcher? The answer is yes. Eerily so. Because here's the thing, Piper in her video is saying that she's just using a recollection of tropes that are very common in fantasy, and for this reason, um, she's not supposed to, or people should not say that she is somehow copying or plagiarizing The Witcher, because 
all of those tropes exist in fantasy, and, you know, the Witcher doesn't own those tropes. She's influenced by the Witcher, yes, because she likes the Witcher, but those tropes are common in fantasy. That's the gist of her argument. And she's not wrong. The thing is, when you start aligning certain tropes up, you start achieving a specific form of storytelling that is very particular to a specific iteration of the Witcher. It's not even the books, it's the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This is further proved for me because in her book, Piper uses fast travel. She makes a way to insert fast travel in her book. And this is not per se something that is inherently bad or something that is inherently plagiarizing, but it's just that when you have a character with a white ha with white hair that can uh, has a, a power that is never explained, that has to do with her voice, that is heavily implied to be the child of a specific kingdom that is warring with other kingdoms, that is taken by an older figure to a faraway place in the mountains to be trained to hunt monsters because this is all of what those people do. And specifically the guy that takes her to this place has a ho horse with a very particular name. That is no longer a coincidence. That is the plot of the witch. And the reason why this is so similar to The Witcher, and it's similar to The Witcher Wild Hunt, because it's in The Wild Hunt where Ciri's powers become an issue. It's in The Wild Hunt that she cannot control them, and when The Wild Hunt is after her. And in the books, this is one of my major criticism of The Witcher books, because I've read them all, and The Wild Hunt is never really explained in those books. Ciri's power and Ciri's lineage are only explained in depth in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt the game. And so I don't know who Piper thinks that she's talking to because people who have read the books as she says she's had and, you know, play the games as she says she had can understand that there comes a moment where coincidences stop being coincidences and it just stops. Be it starts being blatant cop. Again, I'm not saying that this is what she's done. I'm just saying that this softly spoken speech, self-victimizing, doesn't stick with me. Lou is a really big fan of The Witcher. I'll leave her video about The Witcher linked down below. She's she's my favorite nerd. Anyways, the point is, yes, I picked up on even more Witcher shit this time around. I'm hoping that Lou will finish reading this. She did start it and then tell me all of it because, again, she's a bigger Witcher fan than I am. She can pick up on more of it. So I'm, I'm so curious as to what I missed because I know there's got to be more. I'm aware that the author says that there's no plagiarism and the other only overlap is Slavic folklore. Unless everything I just listed in that paragraph is uh, tied back to some Slavic, Slavic folktale I'm unaware of, I'm gonna have to call bullshit. It's at this point that I'm going to draw attention to my makeup because I did do this to make a point. It would be me lying if I said, no, this is my totally original idea. Lots of people use white eyeliner. Lots of people use pinkish orange eyeshadow. This is totally my original idea. It's so silly to say that I knocked off somebody else's makeup, but it clearly did. <laughs> like, clearly I knocked it off. If it's blatantly obvious, if I could sit here in a straight face and be like, no, it's totally not knocked off. Everybody owns white eyeliner. Lots of people use it. That doesn't mean I copied. I would be lying. I did it just to make a point. And it's not just the white eyeliner. It's where the white eyeliner is. It's the color eyeshadow. It's a very particular look that is particular to this one person. It's not just one element that I've taken, it's all of the elements combined that make it a copy. To say that it's not would be disingenuous. Sure, lots of people own white eyeliner, lots of people own orangey pink eyeshadow, but when I use these things in nearly the exact same way as the original person, that's when it becomes a copy. And not saying so is shitty. Yes, I actually did my makeup like this just for the sole purpose of having that conversation. Uh, actually, real quick, let's talk about something else the author said that got the TikTok peoples upset, rightfully so. This book is sapphic. The author said she doesn't want it being called sapphic because people might get the wrong idea, like if lesbians go in this 
this expecting sapphic then they're not going to be happy that there's sex with men in it uh, even though the only sex with men that's had is by the lesbian sex worker it's not like the bisexual character actually having sex with men so we have one lesbian main character and one bisexual main character but don't call it sapphic okay uh that's sapphic though <laughs> bisexuals are sapphic sapphic just means non-men loving non-men women loving women non-binary folks can be sapphic too sapphic does not mean lesbian it just doesn't sapphic fan story fantasy stories featuring bisexual women exist anybody who's been in the book community long enough knows that a uh, fire and stars by audrey colthurst the midnight girls by alicia jasinska uh we set the dark on fire by Taylor K. Mejia, Mejia, The Dark Tide by Elisa Jasinska, or In the Ravenous Dark by A.M. Strickland. The point is, sapphic doesn't mean lesbian fantasy. I don't know anybody that uses it to mean that. I still don't really understand this author's adamance about calling this a bisexual fantasy rather than a sapphic fantasy to market this book when sapphic fantasy or queer fantasy are the terms used in the book community and would have worked and people would have picked up on exactly what she was trying to say. Everyone in the book reading and reviewing space knows that sapphic and encompasses more than just lesbians. I just, I, the only thing that I can think of for this adamance to not use sapphic fantasy, and this came to me while I was reading the book, is this scene where Knox is trying to get this man of, uh, man to be a client of hers and in order to get his attention I'll just read it to you. Knox made a show of dangling the bait around the lounge for a few minutes. It was time for her to move her knight in their game of chess. She'd been given a helpful though predictable tip about what the duke might find engaging. This display of intrigue required her to chat with another girl stroking a slow idle hand down the bare skin of the girl's exposed back while casting sidelong looks at the lordling at the bar, heightening his anticipation with every moment that passed. I forgot to add the part, this is editing Rachel, I forgot to add the part where this guy actually came to the brothel because Emily found him and sent him there, told him I don't really care for the company of men and I've already had the best woman and it says clearly she piqued his curiosity, she'd expected as much, it was a particularly unevolved brand of male who fetishized the fantasy of two women together. She'd pegged him for exactly that sort of man and dragged a finger lightly down her collarbone blah 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 blah. Okay, moving on. So so using women loving women to get men excited as a marketing tactic might be exactly why she'd rather market it as a bisexual fantasy than sapphic because men are less likely to know what sapphic means but definitely understand what bisexual means. I mean that's just a theory based on what's written by the author in the book. Those are her words. So if you're gonna be mad, take it up with her book. Let's discuss Knox because this character's entire arc was something that I was really hoping would change and it did not, which is unfortunate. I said in my last video and I hold to this, this really needed a sensitivity reader. And when you hire a sensitivity reader, you're hiring a very particular person to read for a very particular reason. It's not a one size fits all approach. You don't hire just anybody to sensitivity read. You wouldn't hire somebody with, I don't know, uh, bipolar disorder to sensitivity read for obsessive compulsive disorder. So I understand that the author says that her editor is a BIPOC woman, but experiences by people of color, women of color, are not one size fits all. Because she fan casted originally Knox as South Asian, I therefore think she should have hired a sensitivity reader who was South Asian. I think you should hire sensitivity readers who have the real life experiences that you are trying to cre recreate. I understand she's now saying that Knox's whipping scene was not racially motivated and instead was inspired by her her own experiences with corporal punishment. However, I have read the book twice, so I can definitively say that both though both those things can and do exist at the same time. The entire reason Knox is put in a position where she is whipped is because Amaris's skin, her quote, perfect milky skin, is where her value comes from. So Knox ends up taking the punishment for Amaris and gets whipped. That is indeed racially motivated. It is to save the white character and her whiteness where her value comes from, from being tarnished. It can also be inspired by the author's experiences, but that doesn't not make the context in the book racially motivated. The only reason it happened was to protect Amaris's perfect white skin. 
religion. And I think that that should have never been in the book. Just like with everything else regarding the religion, there were plenty of opportunities where the author could have written in her own experiences without making Knox repeatedly the victim of abuse, including sexual abuse. In general, the way that Knox is treated is completely uncomfortable and really could have used a dedicated sensitivity read, not the editor happening to be a BIPOC woman, hopefully getting that box covered too. The sole purpose of a sensitivity reader would be to look at the text from that angle. Knox isn't given any agency in this book. She's repeatedly sexually assaulted. She's considered a prized servant by the orphanage and then a consolation prize when the brothel owner did not get the white character. Her value comes from her beauty and her only goal ever is to get back to Amaris, whereas Amaris hardly ever thinks of Knox. She's non-stop fetishized for her features and is repeatedly put in positions where she has to have sex with men at the brothel or be assaulted by them and her trauma from this is never discussed. She's just constantly on this path to get to Amaris. Writing a sex worker takes a lot of nuance but writing a sex worker who is also a woman of color is a very particular experience. I think a sensitivity reader is needed for that specifically in order to get it right. Having this one size fits all approach where your editor is a BIPOC woman and therefore you think you have your bases covered, it, it's not sufficient. Like there's this one line where it says about Amaris almost hooking up with her guy friend, the contrast of his rough tan hands against her soft milky skin heightened her arousal. No one thought that that was inappropriate. No one said, hey, the contrasting skin colors heightening arousal is fetishization and maybe take that line out. Like you could have left the skin color out and just said the rough hands against her soft skin heightened her arousal. Why did we bring skin color into it and fetishize that? Like in general, I don't believe that this would hold up to a sensitivity read. Also having read porn work this year, which was an excellent nonfiction book, I do have a review link down below. I don't think that this book exemplifies the kind of shift in looking at sex work as work that that book is hoping for, where sex work should be seen as any other type of labor and talking about how sex works, sex workers, ugh, sex workers have seized the means of production in that industry. There's zero agency given to Knox again. And I don't really understand why a former sex worker wrote a book where sex work was so awfully depicted and the sex worker was repeatedly sexually assaulted only to not explore that was like the empowering of the sex worker moment supposed to be where she sucked the soul out of a serial killer and then slowly castrated him. At no point did we ever have a conversation in the book about anything from an intersectional perspective. And we could have, we could have discussed sex work from that lens and saw what it means to be a woman of color who is queer, who is in a position of sex work and how that unique set of experiences changes that work and how liberation might look for Knox that's different from her white peers. I just, I don't get it. Again, and this was an opportunity to use fiction to explore a topic and it just was not done whatsoever. And where sex work was explored, it was not done well. <laughs> I think a better example, uh, not perfect, but better example of depicting sex work in a fantasy and fiction would be Beyond the Black Door by A.M. Strickland. This is the second time I brought up A.M. Strickland in this book, in this video, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so if you're looking for that, I would recommend that. The Nine and Spoon took more of an approach about sex work similar to Silk Fire, which also did it terribly. I have a review for Silk Fire linked down below. For once, I would really love to see a book that has great sex work depiction, where not only are the sex workers not demonized and their labor is seen as a valid form of labor, just like any other, and also them seizing the means of production, but I would also like to see the clients not depicted as like disgusting, gross, like bottom of the barrel people, but men and women who value the humanity of the people that they seek that service from and see it as labor. I, I wish that this had been that. It really missed an opportunity to humanize and normalize both the work and the workers and the clients. All right, moving on. <sighs> All right, I don't think that this writer is completely without writing ability, okay? I think that there are little seedlings of good ideas here, but there was no take time taken to actually cultivate them. This reads like maybe a second draft and the first version read like a first draft, very much so. I think that the original idea of like two girls who grow up together getting separated and then they get up like swept up in the political machinations of the world that they're living in and also, you know, they have 
uh, stuff in their their history that they need to find out about and they you know constantly want to find their way back to each other in adulthood I think that that by itself is a great idea but instead of having them raised as what felt like sisters and having one pine for the other while the other forgets most of the time about the other it's just uh I just think that that's Mm -mm, I wouldn't have done that. Here's what I would have recommended. They should have grown up in the orphanage together. Yes. We should have spent a lot more time in the orphanage in the beginning. Those like extra one or two added <laughs> scenes were not enough. <laughs> Give me your other foot. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Give me that foot. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Give me that sock. <laughs> Give me that sock. <laughs> And them learning it at the orphanage about what they'll like you know see out in the world and then we would learn along with them too about the politics about the religion and maybe have these kids be taught strict religious values because the church wants them to go out in the world and proselytize wherever they go because more members of the church means more you know money that the church has more power that the church has so we'd have like the church always hoping that someone there would be adopted by someone in a position of great power so that the you know church can also gain a foothold in power. Nox and Amaris being, you know, special, maybe use their powers. They, uh, Nox's power of persuasion, or Amaris's power of persuasion, Nox's power of, you know, making people feel at ease and, and likable. It, it makes her, you know, people like w want to be around her. That being used by the church and them always being pitted against each other by the sisters of the church. And uh, so they inherently see each other as enemies. But then maybe one day something happens and one owes a life debt to the other. Both both are taken in by different places. Knox by a lady who trades in information, who turns out to be a witch trying to get the witches into a seat of power. Amaris by a lady who is a witcher reaver. Uh, the reavers could have been mostly women and run by women, which would make more sense considering that the only deity in the world is a woman. Eventually their paths cross again and they're on opposite sides, but the life debt gets in the way and they start feeling feelings, yada yada. This would have <laughs> been my suggestion. It would have addressed the issues I had with the plagiarism, with the religion not being utilized. It would have taken out the issue with sex work that I didn't think was good representation. It would have made for an actual romance and enemies to lovers, which is of course my shit, uh, and not instead a mostly kind of sisters to unrequited pining on one side and then the other kind of starts to have feelings. Oh, it's just weird. I also would have suggested that Nox have literally one friend in this book. Amaris gets so many friends and Nox gets nothing. Particularly would have loved to have her have a guy friend, but any friend at all would have done. Everyone who wants to be around her either wants to fuck her or wants to use her power, which involves fucking. Nox doesn't feel like a person to me. She wasn't given any agency or dignity. Her sole focus at all times was just her loving Amaris and it was not the same on the other side. Nox could have had friends. There was no reason not to give Nox any friends. Like why? Amaris got so many friends. <laughs> all right, I want to go ahead and quickly address the people that are here in bad faith. I told you to wait until the end of the video. First of all, I was pretty fucking nice <laughs> in my last video and yet I got relentless comments from stands um, and white knights on behalf of this author. Unending comments of just absolute and utter stupidity. Trying and failing to argue with me hissy fit after hissy fit. I also had come to find out the author's best friend in my comments on TikTok on two different accounts saying that I was a bully, saying that I was engaging in mean girl behavior. Um, that person, Meg Smitherman, never should have contacted me. I have tried in every possible way to find any way she could start still be looking at my shit and I'm trying to block, um, but I am no longer engaging with Piper's best friend, Meg, or any of her stands. Um, I'm not doing it anymore. I tried to have conversations in good faith, but y'all didn't come to me in good faith. It was a waste of my fucking time and I'm tired of getting my time wasted. So here's the new plan. From now on, I'm taking your comments. I'm making montages of them and I'm setting them to clown music and I will put them on TikTok so I can laugh at your bad takes. Um, so my answer to any of y'all from now on will simply be thanks for the content. Because here's the thing, my TikTok account, my original TikTok account got banned over this shit, over 
were talking about the plagiarism. And I cannot get over the fact that Piper's best friend Meg Smitherman, who is an indie author herself, showed up in my comments not once but twice on multiple accounts. And ironically, considering the multiple accounts thing, asked me, why are you so obsessed? Ma'am, same question. Same question, considering this is the second account that you're watching me on. What the fuck? So this video comes with two warnings. If you are Meg or Piper or Piper's friends or any of her, you know, people in her vicinity, I get the loyalty. I can, I, I understand the loyalty. Fine to be loyal. You don't have to do it in my presence though. Keep it in your group chats. I don't want you here. I never wanted you here. You're not my audience. This isn't for you. I've asked so many times for authors to stay out of my space. It's not appropriate. That's my boundary. You're not my audience. This video isn't for you. Goodbye. Why are y'all so obsessed with me? Don't be fucking weird. Just block me. Little creeps. I feel like I've said so many fucking times, uh, if you're an author, don't be in my space if I'm reviewing your book or your friend's book. My reviews are not for authors unless we have a prior arrangement. If we don't have that, don't be here. It's not appropriate. And if you're a stan, again, just I'm, I'm warning you, don't be in my comments making bad arguments and saying stupid shit and white knighting because I'm not going to waste my time on y'all anymore trying to have a adult conversation. If you do this, you are hereby consenting for me to use said comments in future comment to make in future content to make fun of you. Why did I wait until the video end of the video to say all of this? Uh, because I know y'all aren't going to listen either way and you're going to end up in my comments anyway. And I wanted to at least get that sweet, sweet ad revenue before y'all violate my boundaries. It's capitalism hours and I've got bills and absolutely zero patience left for boundary violators. So them's the rules, okay? Okay. It's me editing Rachel again. I keep getting comments from some rando once again on my TikTok who's mad about me talking about this book and mad about my original review of it saying that I'm basically trying to say that I'm arguing in bad faith because I don't like the author. I don't give a shit about the author outside of this book. Anyway, the point is they're saying that Knox is bisexual as well. And I have read both books and I was under the impression that Knox was a lesbian and Amaris is bisexual. If that is wrong, I don't know. Uh, if Piper has said somewhere that Knox is canon bi, I don't know. I have her blocked. So, and nobody's ever sent me a video of her saying such. So I don't know. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry that I've been calling her uh, a sexuality that she is not. I was under the impression that she was a lesbian. So, yep, that's that. Okay, moving on. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, like it. If you don't, you can unlike it. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Leave any uh, legitimate comments and questions down below if you want to get made fun of. That's your prerogative. Leave your bad comments down below and I will be sure to set clown music over them post haste. Uh, all the links are down below, all of the videos. Make sure you check out Lou's video on The Witcher. Again, it's so good. I just, I love her so much. She is, I, I am quite stupid, like qu quite, quite a stupid bitch. Lou is not. Lou is extremely intelligent and watching her nerd out about things is just the cutest. I love her so much. Anyway, thanks for watching. Again, how many times have I said that now? Um, if you want, I can review the next book when it comes out. Uh, Bloom will probably blacklist me from getting an arc of it, but whatever. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Uh, so if you want me to review the next one, let me know down below. I tend to just, you know, do whatever my audience requests. And that's about it. Um, okay, thanks. See you next time. Bye.